Hi, I'm Dr. Chung. We're going to talk about atrial fibrillation today, commonly known as AFib. Atrial fibrillation is an arrhythmia. It's an abnormal rhythm of the heart. And let's talk about what that means. Just go over the heart structure briefly. So the heart is a four-chambered organ separated by valves, okay? Blood returns to the right atrium from your head and your legs and liver, goes through this valve called tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, which then pumps blood to your lungs, where it picks up oxygen and blows out carbon dioxide. And this blood returns to the left atrium, goes through this valve called mitral valve into the left ventricle, which is the main pumping chamber of the heart. Then this blood is squeezed through the aortic valve into the aorta, the main artery of the body. And then the blood is delivered to all your organs, and then the whole cycle starts again. Now, the way the heart works is by um, electricity. The heart is made of muscle cells. And these muscle cells require electricity to make it contract and to squeeze. So there is an entirely different electrical system to the heart that's separate from the pumps in some ways. It's like a house. You know, the walls of the house is involved with the electrical system, and yet it's a different system. There is a region of the right atrium called the sinus node. That's the pace setter or the conductor. It tells the heart to beat, beat, beat. And it sends out an electrical signal to the upper chamber of the heart across to the other side and the upper chambers beat. And all that electricity comes to reside in the AV node, right in the middle, between the upper and the lower chambers, the atria and the ventricles, okay? This little node is a kind of a way station. So it's the, the electrical, electrical conduction comes down to the AV node, sits there for about 0 0.2 seconds, typically, and then it sends electricity out to the bottom parts of the heart and the, and the bottom parts of the ventricle squeeze. So squeezes, 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 squeezes. So that's the normal conduction of the heart, okay? Now, from the outside on an EKG, we can see this. So when you look at an EKG, there are different, different components to it. So this is one heartbeat. This is called the P wave, and this is, is called the QRS complex, the Q wave, the R wave, and the S wave. This is called a T wave, and then the whole cycle starts again with the next P, okay? These all represent a function, a different activity that the heart goes through that I just described to you. The heart is broken up into these four chambers, right? left atrium, right atrium, I'm sorry, right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle, as you're looking at the patient. So when the upper chambers contract, that's the P wave. When the bottom chambers contract, that's the QRS. This little delay is that little 0 0.2 second pause that I described to you earlier. And then once the heart is squeezed and squeezed, it now has to relax for a, few s a period to recharge. That's this period right here, the T wave. And then you're ready to go the next beat. So imagine if you're running and your heart rate has to go to 120. Well, this is going beep, 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 beep much faster and the heart's responding much faster. And the heart normally does that. It goes fast and slow depending on your activity level. If you're sleeping, it's probably down in the 40s for a lot of patients. If you're walking briskly, it might go up to 90. It's an amazing system. So it's a, a, an intricate dance, really, between the electrical system, the hormones in your body, and the muscles of the heart, and the valves that go along with that. Now, what is atrial fibrillation? Well, what happens is, for various reasons, as patients get older, this upper chamber comes under stress. It enlarges. It becomes... Um, well stressed. It becomes ischemic in some patients. There's not enough blood going to the walls. And what happens is instead of a normal beat, wait, beat, beat, wait, beat, the upper chamber just starts shaking. So in other words, 
instead of the sinus node sending out a signal, you know, 70 times a minute to beat, it sends out a thousand times a minute. It just sends out electricity without any organization. And what happens is the upper chambers, instead of beating 70 times a minute, it starts to just shake. And there's no conduction uh, that's organized. So instead of the upper chamber squeezing blood into the bottom of the heart every you know, se 70 se times a minute, it just shakes like this. And blood just kind of flows through it passively without being actually squeezed. So the bottom chambers, without having a conductor, now this, this AV node is not a very good conductor. It's just a way station. So now the bottom part doesn't know what to do. It can't go a thousand times a minute, otherwise the patient will die. So what the bottom chambers do is just kind of beats, you know, 40 times, 100 times, 120, 70. It goes up and down. So you might feel a heartbeat that goes irregular. So boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. You know, it's not a regular conducted beat. Typically, we'll say, you know, just feel your pulse. If you can beat your foot, if you can tap out a rhythm to it, that's normal rhythm. If you can't, it's probably AFib. Well, what, what, what are the consequences of this? Well, there are multiple issues. So AFib is this disorganized upper chamber. And the bottom chamber doesn't know what to do, so it just kind of beats on its own, somewhere between 50 and 130 times a minute. So there are symptoms when people get this. They feel their heart skipping around. They feel fluttering. So that's called typically palpitations. Some people feel dizzy and lightheaded. Some people feel short of breath. So there are symptoms that some people feel. Other patients have no symptoms at all. Many patients have no idea they're in or out of AFib. And that's you know, very common, actually. We don't know who gets symptoms and who doesn't. That's not a very well understood thing. So symptoms are very, very uh, important to consider. Well, what are the other things? Clots. As I mentioned, the upper chambers they're not really contracting normally. So the blood is not going through it briskly, meaning the blood is slow and sluggish. And what happens when blood is sluggish and slow? You get little blood clots. So you can get little blood clots here. You can get little blood clots here. The problem is if this little blood clot breaks off and then goes to your head, it becomes a stroke. And so AFib is one of the most common causes of strokes. So that's why patients with AFib typically will receive a blood thinner, like warfarin or Coumadin. And then there are a class of other drugs called Pradaxa, Eliquis, Zorelto, these kinds of drugs that are uh, alternatives to, to warfarin. So that's an option that we need to consider in almost everybody. So AFib is very, very uh, dangerous when it comes to blood clots. Um, and causing strokes. Now, having said that, that doesn't apply to everybody. If you have AFib for 10 seconds every two years, that's very different than someone who's in AFib all the time. So we need to risk stratify who should and who should not get Coumadin or Warfarin, okay? Now, generally, when someone has atrial fibrillation, the algorithm is we have to figure out whether we should do anything about it. Your first decision is to decide whether you're going to pursue what we call rhythm control versus rate control. As I mentioned, some patients have no symptoms at all, so they're doing fine. If they can take blood thinners and they do okay with that, we may just choose to leave him in AFib. Hit him or her, we'll just leave the patient in AFib, give him a blood thinner, then that's how they live. And these patients generally do pretty well. It depends on how old you are and what other disease states you might have, but typically these are patients who are older, who are not symptomatic, and they can take blood thinners without problems. There are many patients who we like to, to keep in normal rhythm because they feel palpitations, they don't feel uncomfortable, they feel uncomfortable, or they're young and you don't want to leave them in AFib for 40 years. So we would try to get them back into normal rhythm. 
And so that's the first decision tree you make. So once you have the decision that you're going to try to put someone back into normal rhythm, that opens up a whole new can of worms, OK? So first and foremost is lifestyle, interventions that improve uh, your chances of being in normal rhythm. So that goes to what causes AFib. It's the same stuff, right? Sleep apnea, hypertension, obesity, valve disease. So there are multiple things that we need to look at that, oh, actually valve disease goes elsewhere, but certain lifestyle interventions can actually dramatically improve your chance of, of going back into normal rhythm. The next thing we would approach would be meds or drugs. There are medicines that can help you slow down the heart and try to keep you in normal rhythm. There's a whole class of drugs called antiarrhythmic drugs and AV node blockers. So beta blockers and calcium channel blockers and a whole class of medicines that we won't go into quite now. But medicines might uh, be added to try to keep you in normal rhythm. Thirdly, at some point, you may need an electrical cardioversion where we bring you into the hospital, put you to sleep for five minutes, put pads on your chest, and shock your heart back to normal rhythm. That's usually effective, almost always. The question is, will it stay that way? And in order to give you a chance to uh, stay in sinus rhythm, normal rhythm, we may have you on medicines and uh, strict lifestyle interventions. But cardioversion is something we might do periodically. Finally, for appropriate patients, the thing that actually can make a big difference is ablation. And Dr. Schloss and other electrophysiologists may be uh, better suited to discuss that. But briefly put, ablation is a way to get into the heart to the upper chambers with a, a wire and a balloon or some sort of a catheter that can find the electrical disturbances and zap it. Just buzz it or cool it so that the connections are, are cut. And you can actually get rid of AFib uh, in the majority of patients if you pick the right types of patients. So that's really um, uh, 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 an invasive therapy, as you can imagine. It's becoming much and much more common because tools have gotten better. Our physicians have had more experience. So the success rates are much uh, higher than they used to be. So that's a viable option for a lot of patients. So just to summarize, AFib is a very common rhythm. It's asymptomatic in many patients, but many patients can't tolerate it. And if that's the case, we have options to try to keep you out of that rhythm and back in normal rhythm. Thank you.